Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hello. Hi. And welcome to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, your creator and host, and with me, of course, I think he's earned himself that seat. Oh. My buddy Matthew. Hello. Hello. How are things this week? Things are great. That's good. I had a very active weekend. You did? Boat riding with the dog, tennis with the husband. It was great. Fantastic. Yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense, and some listeners may find it disturbing. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadian schmoes chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double, and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're like Tony the Tiger today. No, that was... Um... Oh, the Kool-Aid guy. Yeah. Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid, tastes you... great. Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid, can't wait. Did you just burst through the wall? Well, no, you said oh, yeah, earlier, and it just made me think I should just do that. It's easier. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On the evening of January 29, 2017, a young man armed with a pistol and a rifle, which were both concealed inside a guitar case, entered the Islamic Cultural Center of Quebec City, a mosque in the St. Foy neighborhood of the historic town. Just over 40 people were inside the mosque at the time. At almost 8 p.m., the man entered the prayer hall and began firing, and within two minutes he had killed six and seriously injured five other worshippers. After the shootings, the killer simply walked out of the building, hopped into his car, and drove off. Less than 20 minutes later, the perpetrator, a 27-year-old Canadian-born student of anthropology and political science at Laval University, surrendered to police, admitting he was the shooter. The motive? Islamophobia. This is Dark Poutine, Episode 178, The Quebec City Mosque Massacre. Before I begin, I want to highlight the struggle I had when determining whether or not to name the perpetrator of this crime, especially as the Quebec City mosque shooting perpetrator's name was later painted onto a weapon used by the white supremacist and anti-Muslim gunman who committed the shootings at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2019. Those attacks left 51 dead and 40 more injured. There are those who believe that not naming mass killers, like the one in this story, is the right thing to do. Sites like DontNameThem.org and NoNotoriety.com give some intelligently explained guidelines for people telling these stories. One rule of thumb that made sense to me comes from NoNotoriety.com. It reads, quote, Limit the name to once per piece as a reference point, never in the headlines and no photo above the fold. Refuse to broadcast or publish self-serving statements, photos, videos, and or manifestos made by the individual. After initial identification, limit the name and likeness of the individual in reporting, except when the alleged assailant is still at large and in doing so would aid in the assailant's capture. The site DontNameThem.org really brings reasoning home with a quick test. Quote, Do you remember the University of Texas Tower shooting in Austin, Texas in 1966? How about the Columbine High School shooting in Littleton, Colorado in 1999? the Virginia Tech shooting in Blacksburg, Virginia in 2007, or the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Newton, Connecticut in 2012. Can you name the shooters in any of these instances? In any group we speak with, someone can name the shooters. 
but few, if any, can name even one of the victims or the heroes who stopped the killings, end quote. It's for this reason that we'll use the killer's name only once in this episode and we'll otherwise refer to him using nonspecific labels such as killer, shooter, murderer, perpetrator, or man, among others. Douche nugget. Douche nugget is good. Okay. So, yeah, I generally agree with this. I think one thing, though, the public has a right to know who does these things. And I think, you know, naming and shaming is sometimes a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a society, we have to ensure that we actually dig into the root causes of this sort of radicalization. And while we're not naming, make sure we're not uh, missing or sweeping under the rug sort of trying to understand the motivations and the trigger points or ignore these so we can figure out how we can stop it. Right. Right. So I hope the rest of the episode covers that stuff. (laughs) I'm sure it will. Uh, Again, if you want to read more about not naming mass killers, please check out don'tnamethem.org and nonnotoriety.com. And thanks for your understanding. Thank you. The roots of the Muslim community built around Centre Culturel Islamique de Quebec owes its roots to four Muslim students who met at Laval University to get to know each other and talk about Islam in the winter of 1971. According to the Cultural Centre's website, this group was composed of a mathematics professor from India, a visiting mathematical researcher from Pakistan, a doctoral student in hydrology from Bangladesh, and an undergraduate student in forestry from Algeria. It was the first nucleus of Muslim grouping at Laval University. In 1972, they formed their first association and quickly grew out of the space at the Maurice Perrant Pavilion and took up residence in another building on the campus in 1978 in the basement of the Biermans Moraud Pavilion. By 1985, Quebec City's Islamic Cultural Center was formed. In 2009, the CCIQ purchased the property located at the corner of Route de Langlaise and Chemin saint foy for $1.4 million, and this was the site of their great mosque. The Muslim community has grown quite a way since the early 70s, and now stands between 5,000 and 6,000 people from about 15 countries, including 15 languages and dialects and an extraordinary cultural diversity. From their website, cciq.org, quote, All participate in improving the collective wealth of Quebec City and its region, but it must be said that the Muslim community today is not curled up in on itself. It does its utmost to participate in the community life of the greater Quebec City region by contributing to volunteerism of all kinds. And they go on to list a number of places where they volunteer. Life has not exactly been easy for Muslims in the Western world, especially since the hijackings and attacks on the U.S. Pentagon and the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York on September 11, 2001. Those attacks were done according to claims by terrorist organizations in the name of the Islamic faith. True practitioners of Islam know that to any real Muslim, all life is sacred and that it goes against their beliefs to take the life of another person for any reason. However, groups like these involved in the 2001 attacks and subsequent terrorist operations have clouded the view of Islam in the Western world, confusing and scaring some non-Muslims, which is the intent of terrorism. According to Statistics Canada, Islamophobia was on the rise during the close of the 2010s. In 2015, police across the country recorded 159 hate crimes targeted at Muslims, up from 45 in 2012 representing an increase of 253%, and our story takes place in 2017. Among the 40-plus worshippers at the Great Mosque for evening prayers beginning at 7.30 p.m. on January 29, 2017, were six men who would not survive the imminent attack. Khaled Belsemi, 60, an Algerian who emigrated to Canada in 1994 and was now a science professor at Laval University, Azadine Soufian, 57, the owner of a local grocery store, Abu Baker Tabti, 44, a pharmacy technician and a poultry plant worker who'd come to Quebec with his family with the hope of a better life, Mamadou Tanou Barry, 42, an accounting technician, Aldakrim Hussain, 41, a computer analyst for the Quebec government, and Ibrahima Barry, Mamadou's brother, 39, an IT worker for the Quebec government. 
police were able to piece together the shooter's activities in the days and hours leading up to the attack. That month, the 27-year-old was on leave from work due to an anxiety disorder and was not attending university classes at Laval where he was studying political science. His browser history indicated that he was using a lot of his time to Google jihadi terrorist attacks and visited several sites dealing with firearms, mass murder, and suicide. He loved firearms and had passed his firearms safety course, acquired his firearms acquisition license, or PAL, owned at least two firearms, and had been the member of a local gun club for some time. Target shooting had made him proficient in the use of both pistols and rifles. Some of the other websites he visited included articles on Wikipedia about the 2014 incel-motivated killings in Isla Vida, California, the Marysville killings, the murders of nine African Americans in a shooting at a Charleston church, the San Bernardino attack, and the Facebook page of the Femule Movement, a feminist group at the University of Laval. He checked the Twitter tag, hashtag Muslim ban, numerous times. That bloody Muslim ban. Yeah. That that affected me personally. Not Mm -hmm. not in like a, oh. You're a Muslim. Really bad way. No, a Persian friend of mine and I were going to be doing a road trip to Seattle. Right. And he was born in Iran, even though he's like been Canadian- like he moved here when he was young, right? Is he actually Muslim or just he was born in Iran? Muslim family, born in Iran, seven years Canadian. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were just like, we can't go because he's going to be turned around at the border. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. He's like this like super great guy, right? Mm -hmm. Just a Canadian like the rest of us (laughs) happen to be born in Iran, can't make it across the border. Well, isn't that the sort of thing about all these ideas, these blanket prejudices is that it is the the racist the whoever has the prejudice yeah. yeah. whoever has the prejudice thinks oh all of those people those people are like that blanket bands exactly yeah absolutely on the morning of the shootings the 27 year old man ate his breakfast while reading websites about murder suicide and jihadi terrorist attacks Around noon, he started drinking sake, an alcoholic drink he referred to as the drink of the samurai. He continued drinking throughout the afternoon while looking online at articles about mass murders and suicide. According to court documents, quote, he learned on the television that the Canadian government was getting ready to welcome immigrants who had been turned away south of the border. That was when he decided to take action, he confided later during his interrogation. The day before the shooting, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau updated his Twitter account with the following, quote, To those fleeing persecution, terror, and war, Canadians will welcome you. Regardless of your faith, diversity is our strength. Hashtag welcome to Canada. The shooter's right-wing views did not agree with this, and his web history indicated that he had looked at this tweet on the day of the attacks numerous times. At 4.14 p.m., the man consulted the Facebook page of the Centre Culturel Islamique de Québec, CCIQ, looking for the address. Before going to dinner with his parents at their home, again he had visited the website of the CCIQ to confirm the address. His demeanour at dinner did nothing to indicate the horrific and cowardly acts the man was about to undertake. After dinner, he went to his bedroom, where he looked at sites on suicide and mass killings for the next half hour or so. At 7 p.m., the man shut down his PC and took two of his firearms and some ammunition with him. The man told his mother that he was going to run some errands and that he might swing by the gun club for some target practice. Although he'd been drinking for most of the day, he considered himself fit to drive. He hopped into his dad's Mitsubishi and made his way to the Great Mosque. In the car in the mosque parking lot behind the building, the man was thinking to himself, I can't do this. He walked to a nearby convenience store where he bought a vodka ice, which he used to fortify himself back at his car before retrieving his guitar case and packing it with ammunition, a 223 caliber VZ-58 semi-automatic rifle, and his 9mm Glock 17 Gen 4 semi-automatic pistol. The guitar case, with a shoulder strap for easier carrying, fit the guns easily, and he thought it would conceal his weapons to get him into the mosque. While the gunman was transferring the guns into the guitar case, he believed he'd been spotted with the weapons and then told himself that he could no longer turn back. The following timeline of what happened next comes directly from later court documents. 
The timestamps from the six surveillance cameras installed both inside and outside the cultural center provided a video recording of the tragedy and make it easier to describe the actions and movements of the perpetrator at exact times. All the following times are p.m. At 7.54 and 4 seconds, the man is standing in front of the mosque with a guitar case on his back. During this time, Ibrahim Aberi and his brother Mamadou Tanu, aged 39 and 42 respectively, were putting on their winter coats in the lobby of the cultural center, while in the main room other people were talking or praying by themselves. Among them were three young boys who are talking together, sitting on the floor not far from a first archway separating the prayer room from a hallway leading to the main entrance. At 7.54 and 10 seconds, the Berry brothers exited the mosque and took a few steps toward the man with the guitar case as they walked westward. Ten seconds later, the man pulled his two two three caliber semi-automatic rifle out of the guitar case and pointed it at Ibrahima and Mamadou Tanu Barry. He tried to fire it in their direction, but the gun did not go off. In all likelihood, police felt, because the assailant had forgotten to remove the rifle's safety catch. He gave a hint of a smile, trying to give the two men the impression that it was a joke. Frightened, the two brothers went back toward the main entrance and end up with their backs to the door while the gunman continued to point his rifle at them. Two other people standing in the lobby witnessed the scene. According to Heavy.com, witnesses recounted that as the man began to shoot, he yelled, Allahu Akbar, an Islamic phrase that means God is great and is often associated with terrorist attacks. It is also not clear that if it was said, if it was used mockingly. At 7.54 and 26 seconds, while the Barry brothers slid to the ground at the front of the door, the assailant dropped his rifle and takes a 9mm pistol out of his coat. The two brothers quickly stood up in front of the witnesses who were powerless to do anything. The man fired his handgun at Ibrahima and Mamadou, which caught the attention of another individual in the prayer room who viewed the assault through a glass door. At 7.54 and 31 seconds, struck by bullets in his left arm, back, and abdomen, Ibrahima Berry collapsed while his brother tried to escape the killer by fleeing to the east. Quickly hit in the right shoulder and left thigh, Mamadou Berry collapsed in turn on the snow-covered sidewalk while the shooter approached Ibrahima, who was lying on the ground in front of the mosque entrance. At 7.54.35, the witness who had been observing the scene from the prayer room moved in the direction of the mirab, a niche in the east wall of the building, approximately 5 feet by 10 feet in area taking with him the three boys who were talking near the archway. A second later, the shooter killed Ibrahim Aberi with a bullet to the head at point-blank range. The bullet entered near the left ear, passed through Ibrahim's brain, and exited above his right ear. Panic then erupted inside the mosque, and people started running in every direction. The assailant then moved decisively toward Mamadou Barry, who was lying face down in the private lane on the north side of the cultural center. At 7.54.39, the shooter bent over Mamadou Tanu Barry, pointed his pistol at the victim from about 30 centimeters away, and fired a final bullet into his head, resulting in multiple skull fractures, a meningeal hemorrhage, and a cerebral laceration. Mamadou later succumbed to his wounds. Calmly, the killer returned to the mosque entrance, and he took a final glance at the lifeless body of Ibrahima Barry as he entered the lobby. At 7.54.47, Immediately pointing his pistol into the hallway in front of him, the shooter fired ten shots while the worshippers in the prayer room desperately tried to find a place to hide. Taking advantage of the chaos, the killer went back into the lobby and reloaded his weapon. During this time, several men rushed into the mirab, but others, such as Mr. El Amari and Mr. Akjur, could not take shelter there before it had filled up. Saeed El Mari laid down on the ground protecting his head. Others, like Hakim Shambaz, managed to hide behind one of the columns in the prayer room. Some of the worshippers managed to flee through the emergency exit on the east side of the building. A little girl wearing a pink toque ran in all directions, not knowing where to hide. Finally, she stood immobile in the middle of the room until Mr. Shambaz grabbed her and hid her behind a column. Despite the confusion, one of the people present, Ibrahim Bakari Sabai, had the presence of mind to call 911. At 7.55.01, after calmly looking for a new cartridge magazine in the various pockets of his coat, the shooter reloaded his pistol and entered the prayer room. He crossed the first archway and shot at the people hiding in the mirab. He also tried, fortunately without success, to shoot Ahmed Akchahedi and the three children with him, who were running along the north wall of the main room toward the emergency exit. 
Abdel Karim Hassan, age 41, collapsed under a hail of bullets near the imam's office. One bullet fractured two cervical vertebrae and sectioned his spinal cord, thereby causing his death. Azadine Sufian walked toward the gunman. He said to him in French, stop, stop, and pointed toward the east wall of the building. At 7.55.14, Khaled Belkasemi, 60, fell not far from Mr. Shambaz in the first archway. A bullet hit Khaled's left eye, fractured his skull, lacerated his brain, and then exited his head above the right ear. The wounds were fatal. Mr. Sufian walked closer to the shooter and encouraged other worshippers, including Murian Rachidi and Muhammad Kabar, to follow him to incapacitate the assailant. At 7.55.18, while praying by himself near the second archway, Ayman Durbali heard the first shots. He suddenly found himself face to face with the murderer, trying to go toward the shooter. Ayman was struck in the leg by a first bullet and fell to the ground. While Mr. Jabali was trying to crawl, the gunman fired at him six more times, hitting the crawling man each time. Mr. Jabali lost consciousness. Abu Baker Tabti was shot at point blank range on the south side of the room. A bullet went through his back and ended up close to his spinal column while he was struck in the head by three more bullets, causing multiple skull fractures and a cerebral hemorrhage and laceration. The 44-year-old quickly succumbed to his injuries. Azadeen Sufian then courageously rushed at the gunman, who shot him twice in the body in front of the first archway in the prayer room. The 57-year-old collapsed and in the next few seconds was struck by two more shots at close range. The gunman then aimed at Nizar Ghali and shot him in the back. Saeed Akjor was shot in the left shoulder. While running to the Mirab, Muhammad Kabar is struck by a first bullet in the right knee and then a second one in the toes of his right foot. At 7.55.28, lying on the ground, Ezzedin Sufyan was still moving despite fatal injuries to his lungs, aorta, and esophagus. The gunman returned to the lobby and reloaded his weapon. Three or four seconds later, he re-entered the mosque. He pointed his pistol at the heroic Mr. Sufyan and shot a final bullet into his head. The assailant then resumed shooting toward the prayer room. According to several witnesses, the shooter acted decisively, carefully, and in a professional manner, colored by hatred. The video recording fully corroborates this perception. At 7.55.43, after emptying another magazine, the gunman returned to the lobby to reload his weapon again. According to what he said in French during his interrogation, the events took place, quote, at lightning speed as if he had lost control of himself. At 7.55.47, the assailant moved toward the second archway and it appeared, judging from the reaction of the people present, that he was shooting toward the south side of the room. Saeed El Amari was hit in the abdomen. Even though he was in great pain, he continued to pray. Present at the site, Mr. Hakim Ayad described the scene he witnessed as follows, translated from French, quote, I heard the sound of bullets everywhere in the prayer room. I had a strong last-minute physical reaction beyond my control to lay face down behind a column, hearing the cries of my brothers, struck by those bullets and dying, seeing the bullets pass through their bodies. One was dying, another was severely injured. Seeing their blood flow onto the carpet, I thought I would be the next victim. I was between life and death. At that moment, I asked myself how I could know whether I was dead or alive. It was like a living nightmare. I refused to believe what had happened. End quote. At 7.56 exactly, the gunman finally left the room, crossed the lobby, and took the exit and ran away from the mosque toward the west. He left the semi-automatic rifle and the guitar case he had carried it in behind in the snow. In the following seconds, Mr. Muhammad Belkadir who had a few minutes earlier been clearing snow from the steps of an outside stairway on the east side of the building, laid his coat over the body of Mamadou Tanu Berry and noticed that he is still breathing at that point. At 7.56.30, video showed that some of the worshippers were still holed up in the mirab or behind the columns of the prayer room. No one dared to move. At 7.56.47, a man holding a cell phone finally emerged from the mirab and walked toward the north wall of the prayer room. Other worshippers then went to the aid of the dying and the injured. The killer had gotten into his father's car and driven off. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. So what are your thoughts so far on this episode, Matthew? 
It's all rather harrowing, isn't it? Yes, all, very much so. All, like, I was listening to you, and I was like, all that death in like two minutes. Mm-hmm. Like two minutes. It's, two. it's yeah. horrifying. Yeah. What really hit me, I don't know why, but out of all of that, that little girl in the pink toque. Yeah. <laughs> running around and just freezing. It's like. Yeah, she had no idea where to go. Like, and I'm just, I'm just like, and I just could picture it, and I felt so bad for her. And all I'm thinking now is she'll carry the burden of this experience with her for the rest of her life. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just horrible. She's completely traumatized by what happened. Um, hopefully, <clears throat> I mean, children are resilient, yes. Yeah, yeah. And they can possibly heal from a, a situation a little more maybe than an adult, but Mm. no, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe not. So children are resilient, but she's also in her formative years where her ideas about the world are being formed. And this will in with this will inform that in a big way. Uh, And this isn't falling off of the slide in the playground, right? No, this is like, none of us could handle this very well. No. Right. Uh, And a child should not be expected to. Horrible. There was much confusion as first responders, including police and paramedics, arrived at the scene. It was believed at first, and misreported in the press, that there had been at least two shooters. It's now clear that the gunman was alone when he committed his cowardly acts. As well as the six fatalities, there were five others injured, and they were rushed to nearby hospitals for treatment. Police recovered the semi-automatic rifle and noted that the magazine contained 28 rounds, which is illegal in Canada. This means it had been modified. There was another bullet inside the weapon, and the chambered cartridge had been struck. Thankfully, it had been a dud. Had the rifle worked as intended, the number of fatalities at the mosque could have been much higher. Inside the mosque, they recovered 48 9mm casings in various places, as well as two empty pistol magazines in the middle of the prayer room. The placement of the casing showed that the assailant ventured as far as the middle of the room to take better aim at his victims. The shooter took Highway 40 and headed toward Parc des Grands Jardins in the Charlevoix region, intending to die by suicide there, but after some thought was unable to go through with it. Being raised Catholic, leaving aside the fact that he had just murdered six people, he believed that suicide would prevent him from entering the kingdom of heaven. The murderer pulled over on the shoulder near the Ile de Orlans Bridge and called 911 at 8.09 p.m., He identified himself as Alexandre Bissonnette, 27, and admitted right away that he was the mosque shooter and claimed that he was thinking about putting a bullet in his own head. So so let me get this straight. Yeah. I just killed a bunch of people, Mm -hmm. but now I think I might kill myself, so I'm going to call the police. Right. So you want to save yourself. what, what, what What the hell's that? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't really get his logic at all. It well, just sounds like, well, okay. It I sounds don't, like don't what he, he is, just a narcissistic twit. He doesn't have much logic. No. The shooter described the car he was driving, and he told the operator where police could find him. For the next 50 minutes, as the police tack team got into place, the gunman spoke with the 911 operator, Simon Lebrecht, who kept the situation calm, asking the shooter lots of questions to keep him talking until the cops were ready to take him down. Police arrested the gunman without incident at 9 p.m. and informed him of his rights. Police carefully interviewed the gunman in French, his preferred language, over the next day. You can view some of that interview at the YouTube links you'll find in the show notes for this episode. The gunman told officers that as he entered the mosque, he could see several people were at the end of the room and disappeared from sight when he started firing his weapon. His goal, he said, was to save his fellow citizens from future terrorist attacks by going after people he identified as terrorists in the mosque. He felt that he was saving hundreds of innocent lives before taking his own. The problem with the gunman's logic was that none of the people he murdered were in any way connected to any terrorist group. They were all peaceful people and contributing members to their communities. The gunman cited the attacks committed at Parliament in Ottawa in 2014 in which Nathan Cirillo, corporal in the Canadian Armed Forces, was slain, a case covered in dark poutine in episode 134. He also cited the truck attack in Nice, France, in July of 2016, as well as several other events in Europe, the United States and Canada the previous summer, as his motives for the shooting. 
He claimed that he thought that it was just a matter of time until terrorists attacked his family and friends. He said he felt compelled, quote, to do something. Translated from French, the murderer said, quote, It's been months that it's been tormenting me, doing something, you know. Every day, I, I, I was worried my anxiety was going through the roof, you know, and, but I didn't know what to do, you know. I don't know anymore what to do, you know. It got to the point that, you know, I almost wanted to. I wanted to. I want to kill myself because of that, you know, end quote. The gunman was quickly arraigned on six counts of first-degree murder, five counts of attempted murder, and another charge came later, adding attempted murder in regard to the 35 other people, 31 men and four children, who witnessed the shooting and had to run for their lives and hide for fear of being shot themselves. He was not charged with terrorism under the terrorism provision of the criminal code or described as such by terrorism experts as there seemed to be no ties to a terrorist group of any sort. People who knew the gunman, classmates mostly, described him as shy and timid, but others said he had right-wing leanings. He was a Trump follower. He had no close friends other than his twin brother. Others told of a radicalized young man obsessed with guns and full of hate for immigrants. From Heavy.com, Vincent Boissonneau, who grew up with the gunman, was friends with him on Facebook, told the Globe and Mail, quote, I can tell you he was certainly no Muslim convert. I wrote him off as a xenophobe. I didn't even think of him as totally racist, but he was enthralled by a borderline racist nationalist movement. Also from the same article on Heavy.com, quote, The Welcome to Refugees Quebec City group posted on Facebook that it was also aware of him prior to the shooting, saying he is unfortunately known to several activists in Quebec City for his pro-Le Pen and anti-feminist identity positions at the University of Laval and on social networks. Francois Deschamps, a committee member for the group, told La Presse he jumped when he saw a photo of the gunman. We see a lot of what extreme right-wing people do and say, Deschamps told the newspaper. He said the shooter had made statements on their page, quote, acting like a troll. Along with anti-immigrant and other right-wing belief, he also made anti-women's rights remarks, Deschamps said. So <laughs> this is what I never understand, Mike. Okay. Right? So these people purport to be, oh, I'm defending society and all this stuff, mm -hmm. right? But he actually has the same beliefs as not normal Muslims, but like these terrorists right. that he's afraid of. He has the same beliefs, anti-feminist, anti-gay, anti-liberal. And I just don't get it. Do they not realize they're the same? Like those, both sides of those sort of terrorists, they're the same. Yeah. And don't they recognize that the they is those guys? Yeah. The us, Muslim and non-Muslim Canadians who are just normal people, <laughs> are the us, right? Right, yeah. It, it's, it's just weird. Even though the gunman had been apprehended and was safely behind bars, some in the Muslim community feared the possibility of copycat attacks with perpetrators emboldened by the shooter's activity. It is tradition for Muslims to bury their dead quickly. So just days after the shooting, a public funeral was held for three of the six men who had died at the mosque, Abed al-Karim Hussain, both Algerian dual nationals, and Tunisian-born Abu Bakr Tabti. Nearly 5,000 mourners, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and other dignitaries, packed into the hockey arena in Montreal's Olympic Park for the funeral, while many more across Canada viewed the funerals on television. The next day, a second funeral, just as well attended, was held for the other three victims of the attack, Guinean Canadians Mamadou Tanu Barry and his brother Ibrahima Barry, and Azadine Soufian, of Moroccan origin, who had lived in Quebec for 30 years. On October 27, 2017, the coordinating judge of the Criminal Division of the Superior Court scheduled the beginning of the gunman's trial by jury for March 26, 2018. The accused gunman first recorded a plea of not guilty for each of the 12 counts at 9.30 a.m. that morning. But only a few hours later, at 2.32, he had a change of heart and notified the court of his intention to change his pleas to guilty for the charges brought against him. On February 8, 2019, the multiple murderer was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 40 years, having to serve his sentences consecutively, an extremely unusual occurrence in Canadian justice. However, upon appeal, the Court of Appeal in Quebec found that 40 years without parole was unconstitutionally cruel and unusual punishment. 
adjusting the sentence to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. Quebec Crown attorneys are currently seeking to appeal and reinstate the 40-year sentence. Regardless of the lack of terrorism charges, PM Justin Trudeau described the Gunman's Act as a, quote, terrorist attack on Muslims in a center of worship and refuge, and continued to refer to the shooting in that way. Controversially, the gunman's father implored the Prime Minister to stop referring to his son as a terrorist from rcinet.ca, quote, following a thorough and exhaustive investigation where each and every aspect of my son's life was carefully scrutinized, the Crown filed several charges of first-degree murder and attempted murder against my son, wrote the gunman's father in an open letter to Trudeau. The shooter's father also pointed out that the judge who tried his son also confirmed that the crime committed cannot be qualified as terrorism due to the language of the law. The article continues, quote, He added that his son's crime was extremely terrible and severe, and that the absence of terrorism charges in no way diminishes the gravity of the crime, quote, but has no link to terrorism or any other particular ideology. He continued, It also seems to me that the label attached to my son has greatly increased the danger for my family. As an example of the supposed threat to the family's safety, the gunman father pointed out that in April 2017, a man flew from the UK to Quebec in an attempt to find the family. The danger to my family is real, the murderer's father writes. That individual was arrested for making threats, pleaded guilty, and deported from Canada. From CTV News, in response, quote, the federal public safety minister, Ralph Goodale, reiterated that the gunman committed a terrorist act. Quote, his intent was to instill fear and terror in the hearts of Canadians, and as a consequence of his conduct, six Canadian citizens at prayer in a mosque lost their lives, and many others were very seriously injured. That behavior is horrific, and I don't think a semantic argument will satisfy Canadians in terms of that behavior, said Goodale. Mm. Personally, this is my personal opinion, I personally think this guy is a terrorist. 100%. Of course he is. Right? I think that the whole idea that to be labeled a terrorist by law, you have to be connected to some sort of group is, is kind of ridiculous. I think, and I couldn't find the exact wording of the most recent definitions of Canadian terrorism, mm. but I think that has changed. Okay. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of address that at the end of the show when we talk about what happened very recently. Mm. So let's move forward. Okay. Sadly, Islamophobia in Canada has not ended with the Quebec City mosque shootings and the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator there. It seems to be alive and well and growing. In fact, just recently there was an incident in Matthew's hometown, London, Ontario involving a violent racist attack that left four members of a respected Muslim family dead at the hands of an alleged white supremacist who drove his truck into the family as they walked along the road. Salman Afazal, 46, Mahida Salman, 44, Yumna Afazal, 15, and Mr. Afazal's mother, 74, all died in the attack. The family's nine-year-old son was the only survivor and was rushed to hospital with serious injuries. The 20-year-old man in that case had been charged with terrorism, four counts of first-degree murder, and a single count of attempted murder. So I was born in Strathroy, yep. which is just outside of London, but my family lives in London. Mm-hmm. This guy actually comes from a Strathroy family. Yep. I've met his family members, right? My mother had, interestingly, my mother had just moved from that corner. That was her corner where mm-hmm. he murdered that family. Yeah. And she and I talked about that. And then the next day when they raided his apartment, we realized that he lived across the street from her new place. Oh, no. So it's, it's, so this was like close to home. Yeah. Right. But I have to say, you know, my, my nephew who's 15, 14, he'll be 15 in October, asked his dad if he could go on that march. Mm -hmm. And they did a march of support to, uh, to the mosque. Yeah. So I'm really proud of him for that's great. That. Yeah. I, I think the younger generations now are are less tolerant of racism than previous generations have been. Generations that is going to save us all. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> I have hopes for them. Yeah, it's that whole idea, you know, there's that meme of gen, uh, the millennials and the boomers having a big fight. Right. 
And then here's uh, Gen X in the middle. In no pouring, uh, pouring some booze into the pumpkin of the uh, <laughs> of the Gen Z. So it's like you, you and I will be together. We'll we'll yeah. party over here while these two twits fight it out. Yeah, Gen Z, gonna, they're gonna say. Not all attacks by Islamophobes actually target Muslims, highlighting a lack of critical thinking and a lower intellect in those individuals involved in these attacks. Members of the Sikh, Christian Arab, Jewish Arab, and Hindu communities have all reported incidents of harassment which, while intended toward Muslims, was traumatic and broader in its scope than just Muslims. One of the most memorable, public, and cringeworthy cases of Muslim misidentification came on the 16th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. In Brampton, Ontario, an irate woman who'd been heckling approached then-candidate for leadership of the federal NDPs, Jagmeet Singh, who was there to give a speech. The incident was caught on video and lasted almost four minutes, during which Singh maintained his composure and expressed compassion for the aggressive woman, but did not directly address her rants. The woman screamed in Singh's face, claiming he was a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood and would, if elected, enact Sharia law, an Islamic legal code based on the Quran. According to CBC, Singh said in a statement, quote, I chose not to answer the questions asked because I didn't accept the premise. Many people have commented that I could have just said I'm not a Muslim. In fact, many have clarified that I'm actually Sikh, Singh explained in the statement. He goes on to say, while I'm proud of who I am, I purposely didn't go down that road because it suggests their hate would be okay if I was Muslim, end quote. The woman later posted a video in which she stated she is not a racist. If you wish to educate yourself more about Islamophobia, please check out Islamophobia.org, as well as human rights lawyer Arsalan Iftikhar's book, Fear of a Muslim Planet, Global Islamophobia in the New World Order. As well as the usual sources and specific ones named in the show notes, the bulk of the descriptions of the massacre come from an official, extremely detailed 333-page court document used later during sentencing proceedings against the shooter. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 178, the Quebec City Mosque Mosque Massacre. And I know that you have some strong personal opinions and mm. experience regarding what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts on this story, Matthew, what did this bring up that uh, you want to tell us about? I think um, we need to do more as Canadians and as Canadian Muslims. As with any religion, uh, the government needs to stop pussyfooting on hate preachers mm -hmm. who under the guise of Christianity or Muslim or any other sector denomination spouse ha hatred. Yeah. That's one thing we have to do because that paints everyone the wrong way. Right. Right? Yep. The second thing, I think, you know, the Muslim community also needs to ensure that they're calling out any hate speech from their side. I'm not saying that they're not, but there was a time back in the UK that that wasn't happening. Mm. Um, you know, and Mike, like I was doing research on this. Two seconds it took me to find an Alberta website mm -hmm. that is is promoting that gays should be put to death. It claims be to be a Muslim. Because one. Allah yeah. says so. Yeah. And, you know, why does that exist in Canada, right? I don't know if there are free speech rules or whatever, right? Right. But why does it exist? And that does nothing for Muslims, right? right? And, you know, to be honest, you know, we're talking about Islamophobia. Yeah. There's a great deal of homophobia within the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's cultural, really, versus religious. Right. You know, there is a 2016 poll in the UK so that 52% of Muslims thought homosexuality should be illegal. Oh, wow. And this is a respect. So illegal. Illegal. Punishable by something. Something, yeah. right? That's a, that's, this isn't a right wing poll. This is like, a, and you know, my Muslim friends in the UK were like, yep. They're like, try being a gay Muslim, Matthew, right? So. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not extraordinarily different in Canada. You mm -hmm. know, there was a Pew Research poll in uh, 2013 mm -hmm. um, that showed that 80% of non-Muslim Canadians answered yes when asked, should homosexuals be accepted by society, while only 23% of Muslims said yes. Mm. That's changing with the younger generation. You know, my Muslim friends are like, yeah, my parents are a little bit fucked up when it comes to these things, right? Yeah. And, you know, Canada as a society... Actually, you know, we're, we're, we are the most liberal society almost in the world. Right. And it's, the whole acceptance of gays is relatively recent. And 
people will come along, right? And fuckers like these guys yeah. who are going out going, we're defending. It's like you're not doing it in my name. because Nor you, mine. Because you probably hate me as much as you do Muslims. Right. Yeah. And I think love, yes, love, and I don't mean that in a hippy-dippy way, actual love for each other, dialogue, understanding will get us there, right? Yeah. And, you know, so you know, those are real numbers. They're, they're, they're not nice numbers, but they're real numbers. But, you know, it, and I know those numbers, but I'm not an Islamophobe. Yeah. Right? I have, I have like Muslim friends, Muslim lovers. It's, I just know that society changes and will change over time and it'll get better. I do believe yeah. that. True. And by going in and sidelining people because we think they're all sort of this bad, killing people, you're going to do exactly the opposite of what we need to do as a society. Right. Exactly the opposite. All, all he did, he thinks he's part of the solution, this guy? No, he's, he's part, part of the problem. He, he is the All problem, he will yeah. do is radicalize. Yeah. Right? That's right. Period. And we saw that by his name being written on the weapon of the Christchurch yeah. mosque killer. Yeah. So, you know, we, so love, dialogue, education on both sides, tougher stance on hate speech. That's what we need, in my humble opinion. Agreed. Now on to voicemails. If you're so inclined, you can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 877 ptn If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Try and keep it under two minutes, and often the best ones have been written out beforehand. We'd love to hear from you anyway, even if it is to say hi and to tell us just to go shit in our hats. But don't drink and dial. Don't drink and dial, because we've had those a few times. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Here's one that's uh, quickie. Let's have a listen. Hi, Mike and Matthew. This is Karen calling from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States. I started listening to you after the My Favorite Murder Girls recommended you a few years ago. And I just want to say that I absolutely love listening to Matthew as a co-host. He's so thoughtful and kind, and his voice is dark and smooth and really just a pleasure for the ears. I love listening to the stories you present, and even though I'm not Canadian, I'm from the northern U.S., I love poutine, and I play curling on the weekends. Keep up the great work, gentlemen. And Steve, go shit in your dad's hat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So she wants Steve to go shit in Matthew's hat. Well, that would be substantial. Steve probably makes some good-sized poops. You're not saying anything. <laughs> I have to pick it up daily, so I'm not going to comment on it. <laughs> oh, no. Poor Steven. He's so hard done by, Matthew. Aww. You guys don't spoil him at all. He has his own room with his own air conditioner and... No? You have nothing to say? Oh, sorry. I thought you were just talking. I didn't realize you were recording. Yes, he got his own air conditioner. Oh, really? Yes. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, it's kind of for the bigger room, but we could have lived with just one, but he just gets so overheated. Yeah. Poor so guy. I, yeah, he I probably, like Pittsburgh Penguin, um, curling. I'm just I'm thinking of all the cool, icy stuff that he'd probably enjoy. In Pittsburgh, the Steelers, the, the football team, and... My favorite Pittsburgh team as a kid, because of their name, Pittsburgh Pirates. Rawr. Have you ever been to Pittsburgh? No. <laughs> I'd like to check it out. Pittsburgh. What what state is that in? Pennsylvania. Oh, of course. That's sort of like... I know a little bit about Pittsburgh because around that area is where George A. Romero filmed Night of the Living Dead. Ah. Yeah, so... And here's another one. Here's another voicemail. <laughs> Hi, Mike, and Matthew, and or Carol, and of course, Stephen, uh, the drummer. Uh, I'm an avid listener of your podcast and have been for at least the last year. Uh, it took me less than three months, I think, to catch up on the current episodes because of how much I appreciate it. Uh, oh, by the way, I should say my name. It's Portia. Um, I used to co-host my own true crime podcast, and I listen to about 30 podcasts regularly, and yours is definitely amongst my favorite. Thank you for taking the care and consideration you do in your 
your research and presentation of stories especially. I appreciate that you tell detailed stories without aggrandizing criminals for the sake of the victims. Um, I'm originally from Texas, but I've lived in New Orleans, Louisiana for more than a decade. And from a Southerner, I encourage you to take a walk over yonder and drop a big one in your bonnet. Bye. <laughs> You know, just before she said she had a podcast, I was thinking, oh, my God, she has a great, great voice, voice for yeah, radio. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I wish she had said, she was probably being humble, but I wish she'd said the name of her podcast so yeah. maybe people could go listen to the Por show that she used to do. Portia so. has a great radio voice. Yeah, it's fantastic. I wonder if I met her at uh, CrimeCon because I was in Louisiana. Uh, next up, it looks like we have one from either Nova Scotia or PEI. And the reason I am iffy about where that is is because those two provinces share, a, they share an area code. Uh -oh. Yeah, so they're so small. That's <laughs> they so only, sweet. Yeah. But uh, let's have a listen. Yeah, this is Terry from Russian Newfoundland, but I currently live in Dartmouth. Uh, I've been a big fan of the show now for a few months, and I've kind of been all over the place listening to different episodes, and I most have just recently finished uh, listening to the Rum Runners episode. And it made me think of growing up. I grew up in a little town uh, called Rushoon on the Buren Peninsula in Newfoundland. And the Buren Peninsula, at the tip of it, is a little town called Lameline. And in the nighttime, when it's dark, you can actually see the lights of St. Pierre. So growing up, I always went camping. And we always told stories around the fire of my friend's grandparents who were rum runners, and they actually, his grandmother would store the illegal alcohol um, by digging up her gardens and <laughs> putting it under there and then putting the flowers back on top um, for the rum runners who would then come back and get it when they were ready to, like, bring it somewhere else. Uh, yeah, so I thought that was a cool story that I would share with you, and I also just wanted to say that Listening to you guys talk about the trauma that you faced growing up, uh, especially talking about your own monsters, really helped me with my own personal trauma that I've been dealing with the last little while. And just hearing someone talk so openly in an open forum really inspired me to, like, not be afraid or ashamed of what I dealt with. So, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your stories and spreading some light on the dark side of history in Canada. Um, in Newfoundland, we have a saying that also includes the word shit, and it's someday for shit in the woods, hey? And that just means it's a great day outside. So go take a shit in your hat. Thank you. Great day for shit in the woods, eh? I like <laughs> that one. Love it. I really like that. Thank you for that message. It was great. <laughs> it's really good. Um, <coughs> I love it when we have our... <coughs> oh, Mike's choking. <coughs> no one will hear that. I love it when we have our East Coast listeners call in and they have the hint of that accent that I adore so much. And that yeah, I there's miss. a few certain words there, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Have you ever been to Newfoundland? I have not. My sister went to Memorial University in Newfoundland, but I honestly, I have not. But that's the only province that I haven't been to. Okay. I, I plan on visiting Newfoundland, Labrador uh, at some point and then hitting those uh, territories as well because mm. I haven't been to any territory. So mm. otherwise I've been to every province in wow. Canada. Yeah, yeah, I went to St. John's, God, 1989. I guess technically I have been to Newfoundland because I landed in Gander before I went to Paris when we were flying to Paris before. So Why did you land in Gander? At the airport. Why? Um, because it was like the last place to refuel before. Okay. Before you go across the ocean. And this was in the 80s, so I guess the planes weren't. Yeah, they weren't as fuel efficient. Right now, they now they don't need to do that anymore. They, yeah, right? but they did. we did that at that time. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. And that's it for voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. P T N. Now on to patron and donut money shout outs. Oh boy. 
Let's see if anybody gave us some love. Give us your donut money. <laughs> so first up, as far as patrons go, we have May Lapsley. And May, it looks like, is pledging in Australian dollars. Yay. So that sort of tells us where she's from. Would you want to take a wild guess as to the city or town or... Is she just uh, on walkabout in the outback? She's in Woolamaloo. Woolamaloo? Yeah. Is that a real place? Woolamaloo is a real place. How do you know about Woolamaloo? Because I know a really filthy joke that includes the place Woolamaloo. Well, then we can talk about that perhaps on the Yumber Yard. <laughs> okay, I'll tell the joke then. Okay, but tomorrow after the show hits the... Yeah. yeah okay. So... What does May Lapsley do in Woolamaloo? Woolamaloo. What does she do there? She's an airplane pilot. Oh. Yeah. Do you need to fly in and out of Woolamaloo? Is it that yeah, remote? Yeah, Woolamaloo has a massive airport. Oh. So yeah. is it like Woolamaloo International? I've never heard of this. It is. Oh, nice. <laughs> Just making this shit up. And they are, are the only place that actually fly the Concorde in and out now still, right? True. Yeah. True. But it's not a real, it's not the plane Concorde. It's like a, the bird. <laughs> she think has a little saddle on a Concorde. Yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, she's a pilot in Woolamaloo. There you go. And I think, uh, one of our callers actually is our next patron. So we just heard from Portia in Louisiana. She lives in New Orleans. New Orleans, as they say. New Orleans. New Orleans. And yeah, her name is Portia Maxine. So yeah, I think this is our most recent caller. And we, so we know she's got a great radio voice and she had her own true crime podcast. And is that a real name? Portia? Yeah. That's a cool name. I like that name. I knew a woman, her, her name was Mercedes Window. Mercedes Window. And she was a belly dancer. Carol's mom went to school with a lady whose name was Berna Twig. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, Portia has a great name and voice for podcasting. I'm actually worried they're going to hire her to co-host instead of me. No. Okay. I, uh, it's it's really hard to get her here from New, Orla New Orleans every... Uh, Depends how much donut money she sent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> there's a price on my head anyway. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Portia. Thanks, Portia. And thank you for your call. And next up, we have Karen Branspall. Wow, that is a mouthful. And it looks like Karen is pledging in Norwegian kroner. Excellent. So we're wondering where, on, where in Norway is Karen from? Mm hmm Karen Branspall. Oh, where is she from? Yeah, in Norway. She's from Trondheim. Oh, what, what happens there? What does she do there? Well, it, it's on, um, a fjord. Okay. Uh, is she pining for the fjords? Like the Norwegian blue parrot? I don't understand that comment. It's the, it's the pet shop sketch from Monty Python, the parrot sketch from Monty uh, Python. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to say something that's going to horrify our listeners. Oh no. Monty Python is totally overrated. This is Matthew's last <laughs> week as the co-host of... No, Justin, I tried watching it the other day and it was just like boring. Again, Matthew is <laughs> no longer the co-host. Anyway, she's no, from Trondheim can... and she uh, looks after the fjords. She looks after the yeah, fjords? Yeah, she's an environmentalist. Oh, nice. Yeah. I want to go to Norway now. I do too. I want to see Norway. I want to see a there's lot a, of Scandinavia. There's a beautiful cathedral in Trondheim. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to see that part of the world. That's it for patrons this week. Let's Thank move you. On to, let's move on to our donut money donors. Donut. So our first donut money donor is Gordon Bird, and Gordon just says nom nom. <laughs> Where's Gordon from, Matthew? Where is Gordon from? Yeah. He's actually Swedish. Oh, he's Swedish. So again, yeah. with the... Uh, yeah, we're just keeping a... It's like a theme here. Right? Okay. He's from Sundsvall. Yeah. In Sweden. Oh, wow. And what does he do there? It has something to do with birds. 
Well, because his last, thanks to his last name. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, a, a specific type of bird and. Uh, no, he, he, um, he is sort of a, what do you call those? Twitchers. Twitchers. That's what we call them. Bird watcher. Yeah. In the UK, we call him twitchers. He's a professional twitcher. Well, our friend Art is a big time twitcher. Twitcher. Do we say that here in Canada? Twitcher? No. Nope. Okay. I don't think so. Maybe we do. Maybe, maybe only the twitchers say it. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I always think of somebody being a twitcher as something sort of rude. But anyway. No, I don't think it's rude. Mm hmm. Do we say, how about anorak? Have you heard the term anorak? anorak is a raincoat? Yeah, but like a, a sort of a geek who like an anorak in the UK as well. Oh, really? I used to like the song Tears on My Anorak when I was a young <laughs> young man. But uh, I that song is so obscure, I can't find a copy of it anywhere on the internet. That is an obscure song. Tears on My Anorak. Okay. Yeah. I've never heard it. Yeah, it's quite good. If anyway, I can find it, I'll send it to you. Thank you, Mr. Bird, for the donut money. Thank you. Nom nom. And here we have, again, from Heather Rajat, another Donut Money donation. And she says, hi again, Mike and Matthew. Greetings from Smelly Guelph. Guelph. Smelly. I don't know why Guelph would be smelly. My dad went to vet school there. It might have to do with Everyone that. in Canada who went to vet school went to Guelph. Uh, well, there's one in PEI now. Yeah, but Guelph is like, you know. It's, it's the bomb. It's the bomb. <laughs> um I had to donate again as a token of my appreciation. Last week, Lana decided to try something new and got sprayed in the face by a skunk. Oh, I saw that on the Facebook. I don't know if you've ever tried to get skunk butt juice out of a bulldog face wrinkles, but <laughs> it isn't very fun. Thank goodness I had your podcast to keep a smile on my face. Please tell Steve it had no effect on her ravishing good looks. <laughs> Enjoy some treats on me and have a giggle over my misfortune. I'm totally going to go visit them in Guelph when I go home to see my mom next time. That would be fun. Yeah. I would like to go with you to uh, Ontario so I could... Thank you for the donut money and say hi to Lana and give her a little pet for us. Exactly. Next up from Havelock, New Brunswick, we have Michael Cormier. Well, what a good... Michael, French name. Michael Cormier. Cormier is yeah. very... Lots of hockey players named Cormier. I wouldn't know. Right. What does Michael do there in Havelock, New Brunswick? He's a locksmith. Oh, he's a locksmith. If you have lock, have I lock? fix it. Have lock, I fix. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> well, hopefully that is what he does because that is really, really funny. Thank you for the donut money. Have lock, I fix. <laughs> he says it with a Russian accent. Yeah, exactly. As well. And, uh, of course, we would be remiss if we didn't mention somebody who sent us some donut money via Interac, Inter and that's Brianna Sigurdsson. She says, started your podcast in March and just caught up, so figured it was a good time to send you some donut money. Thanks so much for the awesome entertainment for my commute. Brianna from Buena Vista, Saskatchewan. From Buena Vista to Vancouver Island. Exactly. You know that song? Yeah, but from the Arctic Circle. But the Buena Vista they're talking about, I, I think, know. is Newfoundland. Yeah, because it's the other side. Right. But I wanted to sing it anyway. Did you learn that song in school? We did, yeah. This land is made for, for you and me. me. Yeah, I, I do remember that. So what does Brianna do there in Buena Vista, Saskatchewan? She... Uh, officially tells people that they've gone to the wrong Buena Vista. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the one they're singing about. She stands at the airport and just says that. Yep, this is not the Buena Vista that you're <laughs> singing about. <laughs> wow, that's a great job. And I'm sure that there's a lot of misunderstanding like you just had. Oh, did well. you ever hear about that young couple flying from the UK to Sydney? Sydney, oh no. They flew to Sydney... Um, Victoria, like outside of Victoria in right. Vancouver Island, and they meant to go to Australia. No, the Sydney on the other side of the country near where you're from. Oh, okay. So they they went to Sydney in Cape Breton. Yeah. And, and they meant to go to Australia? Yeah. Oh, no. Because Nova Scotia sort of looks like New Zealand. And they, <laughs> they, they said in the interview, they're like, when we got off the big plane in yeah. Canada and got onto a smaller plane, that's when we clicked that something might be wrong. <laughs> Yeah. You know what the airline did? What? They gave them free tickets to Sydney. Well, that's nice. Yeah, because it became, it was a huge thing and it was... Uh, I that's, it's really funny, actually. Yeah. Well, like, Sydney, Nova Scotia is a nice place to vacation. Yeah, but, but if you're expecting to go to Sydney, Australia, it's, it'd be... Yeah. A, and by the way, Woolloomooloo 
is a suburb of Sydney. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. There's no opera house in Sydney, Nova Scotia, as far as I'm aware. I haven't Googled that, so don't come at me. Uh, I just, you know, I know it wouldn't be as, as uh, ostentatious as the opera house in Sydney, Australia. Yeah. That reminds me of that Bette Midler song. What's that? Uh, one night at the opera, he saw an Aida, whose bust was so big it would often impede her. Oh, dear. Help us. Matthew's that attempting was, song. It's from the Beaches soundtrack. Oh, there you go. I didn't see that movie. Mm. Bette Midler's cool. It's, I hear Beaches is sad, so I didn't. I don't like sad movies. It's a sad movie. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot to us if you did. You can easily find us on... You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Don't forget my book... Murder, Madness, and Mayhem is available for pre-order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of our website, please check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take your time to give Dark Poutine a like or follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return. It is. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Thank you, everybody. Thank you and good night. Good night and goodbye. Oh, and Werner Herzog says good night. <laughs> I am so glad that uh, you invited me to the end of the show. Spokojne noche. Was ist los? <laughs> who is this man you have, Mike? Who is here? Oh, you mean Matthew? Yes, um, his beard is interesting. Uh, it it puts me in mind of something uh, rather Neanderthal. <laughs> I have to trim it. It's out of control. Matthew needs a beer trim. I do. Do you want to do it for me? Guten Tag, anyway. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs>